The chapter we had last week. The last spoke last week. Last week, Paul. And the week before, I read. But they happen to know they got back to the and then they said three. We got back to a thin giant part of the road. It's a terrible long road, and they were only 20 minutes late. Last time they went, they were four days late. So they picked up a lot of time this time. That's wonderful. John 14, verse 17, pardon me just a little bit. It almost bankrupts at least my vocabulary to try to describe this amazing chapter. I remind you again, it begins in the 13th chapter of this gospel. And as we said, when you go in chapter 13, Jesus reveals the Lord's Supper and the washing of feet. Chapter 14, verse 26, he mentions for the first time the Holy Spirit, <coughs> the comforter which is the Holy Ghost. I always think of my old teacher, dear Samuel Chadwick, used to say, remember that word comforter, a Holy Ghost is a comforter, but he's not a nursing mother for spiritually sick people. Yeah. It's a bad translation. Actually, that word Comforter is, is a Latin word, comfortis, K-U-M-F-O-R-T-I-S, with strength. Didn't Jesus say when the Holy Ghost is come? He shall receive power or receive strength when the Holy Ghost is come. <clears throat> it's been called many things, this amazing chapter. You know, we're, we're kind of limited in English... Uh, for instance, we've only one word for love. A woman says, I love my dog. And then she says, oh, and I do love my husband. Maybe it's the same kind of love, I don't know. But anyhow, <clears throat> the Greeks had at least four different words. But we interchange words carelessly in English, don't we? You see an accident, a very horrible accident at the end of the street. You say, it was awful. It wasn't. It was terrible. This chapter is awful. What do you mean awful? It's full of awe. That's what awful means, full of awe. You want to stand back and survey it and see its majesty. I think you can liken, well, at least I can, because I want to, Matthew, Mark, and Luke as being the outer court in the tabernacle of all. John 17 as being the holy place. No, pardon me, Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the outer court, John as the holy place, and John 17 as the holy of holies. He said again, you go from uh, the 13th chapter, keep going through the book, is like going through the river in the 47th chapter of Ezekiel, where every time we take a stride, the river is deeper, water to the ankles, to the knees, to the loins, water to swim in. And you can read this amazing gospel, as we call it, the gospel of John, in the same way. Every chapter gets deeper, deeper, deeper. What's the climax? <clears throat> well, there's a double climax, if you like. See, this chapter is so awesome that so many people have said this is the most amazing prayer Jesus ever prayed. I don't believe that. It's the longest prayer Jesus ever prayed. That is not so. It is the longest recorded prayer. People have said to me for 50 years, why do you stress prayer so much? Because Jesus did. Jesus was being baptized in Jordan. As he was being baptized, he was praying when the Spirit descended on him. At the end of his journey on the cross, while the other evangelists tell us that he died, Luke says, as he died, he was praying, Father, forgive them. Luke emphasizes every event in the life of Jesus with prayer. He went to the Mount of Transfiguration, and as he was praying, he was transfigured. Remember Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. It's the same Greek word, be transfigured, by the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your personality. 
If you want a new personality, the best place to get one is in the place of prayer. Yes. He prayed. He spent the whole night in prayer before he chose his deacons. I would to God every church in the country did that, had a whole night of prayer. Half the boys wouldn't get in. Oh. The condition of being a deacon isn't that you own a big business and this, that, and the other like most places. It's because they're full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Which is an awesome challenge. But after he had spent the night in prayer, I think I asked you once before, years ago maybe, if you could only relive one day in the life of Jesus, what would you relive? Nearly everybody says the day he went and raised Lazarus from the death, that day, that would be exciting. Or when he walked on the ocean, the sea, that would be tremendous. If I could choose one day, I would choose this day. I may be wrong. <clears throat> I've been wrong once or twice, so what? I've traveled far, I've been preached in the biggest churches in the world, many of them. Met some of the great preachers. I never judge a man by his preaching. Let me pray with him, I'll tell you what kind of a man he is. A man may be a good preacher because he has a good memory, a good personality. He's loquacious or eloquent, whatever you want to say. I remember Dr. Tozer gave me so much counsel when we were just together, the two of us. He said, Len, remember one day that we preachers are not descendants of the Greek orators or of the Roman orators. If we're really God's men, what are we doing? We're in line, if we're really where God wants us, we're descendants of the Hebrew prophets. It's not, this is my opinion, or this is the latest textbook idea. It's, thus saith the Lord. To use the word again, it must have been awesome to see Jesus standing there, lifting up his eyes to heaven. We usually close ours, I don't know why, unless it's to save us from being distracted. But he closed his eyes and said, well, Father, the hour is come. Again, lots of people say he was entering the final days, which he was, of his life, and there was a gloom over him. Not in your life, not on your life. Why are you so sure? Well, look at the last verse in the 16th chapter. Yeah. What does he say? Doesn't sound like a man that's overcast and heavy. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It was already settled in his heart. Now, will you understand this? It sounds like heresy. If I say Jesus did not die on the cross, he died in Gethsemane. If he hadn't died to his own will and embraced the total will of the Father, the manifestation of his death was on the cross, for sure. What a wonderful moment it must have been. He says, Father, the hour is come. Do you know what that meant? It meant you could kind of break that little word Father up for billions of people. The only reason you and I can tonight can say, Our Father, which I, and remember that's the first thing he taught them in brain. Our Father, what was the second thing? Thy kingdom, thy will be done. He doeth, doeth the will of God, isn't it? John says, He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. <coughs> I remind you, Abraham never called God Father. Neither did Moses, neither did Joshua, neither did Obadiah, or any of the major and minor prophets. He revealed God in a new relationship. Read through the chapter, he calls him Father, he calls him Holy Father, he calls him Righteous Father. <clears throat> it is not true either that the, the prayer is only for this disciple. We say he was praying here for his disciples. No, verses 1 to 5, he prays for himself. Verses 6 to 19, he prays for the disciples. Verses 20 to 26, he prays for the world. People say, oh, he, he wasn't praying for the world. That's exactly what he was praying for. Wasn't the climax of his prayer, the 17th verse of this 17th chapter, sanctify them through thy truth? Come on, why does God sanctify us? To make us ornaments? No, to make us instruments. Unless we pure, we're not pure, we'll contaminate the message we give. With our blurred thinking, with our selfishness, with our stupid little opinions. 
I'm realizing more and more and more that few preachers preach the word of God. They preach about it. They don't preach it. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Again, the symbol of the church of Jesus, this is way out on a limb for some people. Because you may have one round your neck or you may have one on your daddy's tombstone. The symbol of the church of Jesus Christ is not a cross. The cross is Roman. The cross is cruel. The symbol of the church of Jesus was a tongue of fire on the head of those men in the upper room. Again, why wasn't it a dove that sat on them? I think they would have been more convinced. They would have said, well, that's what we saw on the head of Jesus there in the Jordan. There's a little dove fluttering from head to head to head. <coughs> I remember we had a night of prayer in a place called Gillingham. <coughs> Many of you have read that, that book, uh, what's he called now? God Smuggler. In it he mentions a little man there. I've forgotten the name of the man, but he used to come to a prayer meeting that we had in that little town. It was an old, old Methodist church. I remember that uncle something. Uncle Hoppy, there, thank you. Uncle Hoppy. He had the most disgusting automobile you ever saw in his life. And he was wealthy. He was a, a builder. He built huge buildings. One day he had uh, all the pay packets all worked out in his office, and a missionary came in. And the missionary said, uh, he said, Oh, Alton Cloppy said, are you in need? He said, yeah. Yes, sir, I am. I believe God sent you to me. He said, uh, well, God, I felt Lord said, go see Uncle Hoppy. He said, how much do you need? He said, uh, about $40,000. Oh, he said, wait a minute, I'll get it. And he opened his safe and he gave all the wages of his workmen away to the missionary. <laughs> So when it came to pay time, they said, we're waiting for that. He said, I'm sorry, no money. What do you mean? My wife has to pay rent, buy groceries. What are we going to do? Oh, the Lord will provide. They didn't know any more about the Lord than they knew about Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I'll pay it on Monday morning. And he had a dime. And he paid it Monday morning. It happened a second time. And so because he got away with it once, he tried it a second time. He misfired. <laughs> Gabriel forgot to bring the pay packets. You see, we, we can presume very often on God because it works once doesn't mean God wants me to do it every time. But by the same token, that man was a precious man of prayer. I remember that night particularly. We prayed from, from about uh, nine till about two o'clock or later that next morning. An old lady sitting in a wheelchair at the back of the church, she said, wasn't that wonderful, Brother Rainey? I said, yes. I, said, I felt such a release you know, there were two men there that really had an anointing every time they prayed. And I was so sanctified and selfish that I always got between them. You know, because every time they prayed, there was something spilling out of them. So I got wedged between them because I knew I'd get blessed. And boy, could they pray. But she said, at half past one, wasn't it wonderful? I said, I don't know. I wasn't looking. I was sitting here, she said, I was watching those men wrestling in prayer. They had their coats off and they were going at it. And then it happened. I said, what happened? A tongue of fire came. At the far end and went from, on every one of the, didn't you feel it on your head? I said, not particularly. I felt a sense of blessing. But she said, that tongue of fire went from one head to the other. All through the whole, well, there were about eight of us. It was a very blessed experience. Why do you think those people winced? Bless your heart, those Jews and uh, priests on the day of Pentecost, they got armor plating on the hearts. And all that happened was the Peter that ran away from a little girl's finger was so endued with the power of God, it was like we were, I was praying with my dear son the other day, wonderful guy. We were praying about anointing. And dear... <laughs> Paul said, God, we need these days a tongue like an acetylene torch that will burn right straight through an iron girder. Yeah. It's not very big. It's not this width. It's maybe it's as wide as my finger, but that guy puts it down that girder, it's like putting a knife through, knife through butter. 
I like this figure of speech. I'll, I'll use it sometime. I won't say where I got it, but I'll use it. <coughs> I thought, what a picture. Here are these men that choose it. Imagine Peter that ran away saying, you crucified the Lord of glory. And it says they were pricked, they were stabbed, they were burned in their hearts. Why do you think a little guy standing by a river that has no financial backing and no crowd behind him? He stands there and the soldiers have armor plated on, armor plate and plumes, they come from a foreign country, didn't know a thing about God. They listened to this as a man, John the Baptist, and they cried out. Again, you don't make altar calls in revivals. Altar calls are made when we sense the Holy Ghost isn't there, so we help him out. When the Holy Ghost is there, I've seen people crawl down the aisle before we finish preaching. That's going to come back, too. Paul was talking about revival that they had. <coughs> I think it was in Argentina a few years ago, where a man labored for eight years and preached only to his wife and I think six children. People said he's crazy. He has a little denomination of his own, a wife, six children. And he's eight of them. One day the Holy Ghost came upon them. He marched down the street with his wife and children and, and everybody came out of houses and went with him without sounding trumpets or anything. The Lord just moved over them. Oh, how artificial we are. How we've got everything measured out. Somebody leads the singing so long and somebody does something else. There's not much room for the Spirit. Let's jump for a moment over here to the 13th chapter of Hebrews. <coughs> Verse 13. <coughs> oh, verse 12. Wherefore also Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. <clears throat> now look at verse 11. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary. The high priest brought what? The blood of the beast. What did Jesus give? His own blood. Verse 11. The bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. The bodies are burned without the camp. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate or outside the gate. If you read Exodus 29, you'll find there that the beast, when it had been killed, its body was taken out to burn. It was a sin offering. The blood was taken into the Holy of Holies by the priest. But Jesus shed his own blood, presented his own blood. Again, outside of the gate. <coughs> Do some homework on that. See what it's like. What does it mean to go outside of the gate? Do you remember when in Exodus, when the children of Israel offended God? Uh, Moses had the, the tabernacle, the holy part, removed outside of the camp because he said, God has forsaken you. God has rejected you. Well, Jesus goes outside the gate. Why? Because God has forsaken Israel. They thought they were going to cut Jesus off. He beat them to it. Pardon the phrase, but he did. What does it say? Pilate says, I'll take your life. Jesus says, you can't. I'll lay it down when I want, and I'll take it up when I want. But Jesus, that he might sanctify the people, suffered outside of the gate. I have never in my life, I'd, I've heard preaching, I was going to say 75 years, I'm sure I've heard preachers for 72 years anyhow, all over the world, all kinds, all denominations, what have you got? I've never heard one person talk about the agony that Jesus had in going into that rotten place there, outside the gate. We used to sing a hymn in England written by Mrs. Alexander, she, meant she married Alexander who was at that time the Billy Graham of America. She wrote a lovely children's hymn, There is a green hill far away without a city wall. Which means outside the city wall, where our dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. 
outside the pale. Why? What does it say in the 50th chapter of Isaiah? Or in the 53rd, it says he made his grave with what? The rich and the wicked in his death. He says in the 51st chapter, he gave his back to the smiters. I wish we'd change this horrible habit, I think it is, I'm going to ask about it anyhow, of having a communion service at the end of a preaching service. I believe we ought to meditate on the finished work of Jesus Christ for an hour before we partake of communion. We don't esteem it as we should. <clears throat> what did you sing tonight? You sang, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place. I mentioned before, Barabbas must have looked at the cross where Jesus was and said, I should be on that cross. I know those two thieves I've murdered and stole with them and raped and done every wicked, damnable thing. And that holy man never did anything wrong. As the hymn writer says, those kind hands that did such good, they nailed them to a cross of wood. And here he is going into the most horrible experience ever. I think there were two. One was Gethsemane, where the whole of that 22nd Psalm became real in his life. A young man wrote to me from Canada this past week. He said, there's a popular doctrine up here that Jesus went to her on our behalf and suffered. The hell that Jesus suffered, as far as I'm concerned, is separation from God. That hell. I'm not bothered about temperatures, not bothered how big it is, not bothered where it starts. Se hell is separation from God. When you call and there's no answer, when you're frantic and friends with it. Yeah. But all they sing over and over and over for millenniums is the harvest is past, the summer is ended. I believe every damned person there will feel the tract in his hand that he wouldn't stuck and throw on one side. I believe he'll hear his mother's prayers thundering in his ears for, for, for a millennium. I believe every time they grieve the Holy Spirit that torment will come to them in perdition. God is a just, he's a holy God. But let's see Jesus going down there into that horrible pit What did they do outside the gate? Well, that's where the lepers were allowed to go. They weren't allowed anywhere else. I remember doing some missionary work there in Thailand, North Thailand. We took a train. And a couple asked me, they're with Worldwide Evangelization Crusade at headquarters now. They asked me, would I like to go to a leper colony? I said, sure. I guess we were almost half a mile away. The way, it was a downhill, you know. The wind was coming down on us. The stench was indescribably rotten, corruption. When we got there, there were people with half an arm, people with had no fingers, people whose whole cheek was eaten away and a little thread holding their eyeball in. A blind man on the shoulder of a man who had half a leg and he was hopping along on a, just a branch of a tree with some leaves under. His arms must have been raw. There's every form of degradation. This was the fina finality for Jesus in humiliation. Every sin that lashed the human heart lashed him there, I believe. He saw corruption in its ultimate. Here is the most undefiled man the world has ever known, seeing, seeing the greatest defilement the world has ever known. He's of holy rise and to behold iniquity, and yet he sees that terrible mass of corruption. And he doesn't back off. Bearing shame and scoffing root. There'll never be a computer that can compute the horror of that situation. I don't understand how Jesus, the heaven of heavens, couldn't contain him. Suddenly he's pressed into the, compressed into the womb of his mother. How did the Ancient of Days become the Infant of Time? <coughs> it's amazing that God could become man. It's more breathless to think he not only became man, he became sin for us. He took the torment of our damnation. He took the agony of our separation from the Father. And I see somebody advertising uh, Christian comedians. Makes me sick. 
They've never seen the finished work of Christ when they do that. Or they haven't seen Christ in the other aspect when he's lifted up in Isaiah 6. But here he is bearing shame and scoffing root. We're told in the word, by one man's disobedience, sin entered into the world, and because of sin, death came. But by one man's righteousness, the last Adam, not the second Adam, as Newman says, he has a lovely hymn, praise to the holiest in the height, and he says, O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam, no, 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 no. If you have a second Adam, you can have a third. Adam in the garden was the first Adam. Adam in the garden of Gethsemane is the last Adam. He's going to undo all that the first Adam has done. Doesn't matter how many billions of transgressions there are, God is going to accept one sacrifice. Jesus is going to take all our human corruption, which was worse than all the filth and impurity. You see, the place where he went outside the city wall was the place where all the drainage, all the corruption came. All human filth. Bodies were thrown there. Carcasses were thrown there. There was a gallery all around it. It was a gallery of bodies of men who had been crucified, maybe for days, and the birds had just about picked their bodies clean. And there there were these hideous skeletons all around. And here is the Holy Son of God who had been surrounded with angels in eternity. I don't believe anybody else could have taken that. I believe that was the kind of stuff we were going to see for all eternity, except he had redeemed us. In my place condemned he stood, and he sealed my pardon with his blood. Well, that's the first half of the text, isn't it? Wherefore, verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, in the 13th of Hebrews, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffer without the gate. Now what about the other half? Are you ready for it? Let them, no, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Do you remember in the 11th chapter of this amazing book of Hebrews, it says about a man that lived 2,000 years before Jesus? God alone could explain this, I can't. A man called Moses, he was trained, he was going to sit on the throne of Pharaoh, he was a son of Pharaoh's daughter, he was going to rule the richest, most powerful empire in the world, and suddenly, somewhere, somehow, he had a vision of Jesus, it says, that when Moses, what did he do? He said he saw Christ afar off, doesn't it say? What's the verse? Oh, I've got it here. Now, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 26. Verse 24. By faith Moses, when he came to years, refused. Here he is, a mature man, refusing. When you go home, read his life story in the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. He was mighty in word. He wasn't an orator. He stammered. He was mighty in word. He was a lawmaker before ever he got the Ten Commandments. He was mighty in deed. He ordered that government around. He ordered the armies around. He was mighty in word and deed. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That must have been something. I'd like to have seen him turning his back on Pharaoh's daughter. Nobody ever told me that Moses were a hero. If you, if you escape from, from death like he did, because that's what they were trying to do, kill him, would you run back straight in front of, of the Pharaoh standing there on his throne? That's one of the most amazing deeds of moral majesty in the whole of the word of God. He's walking into a death trap. There's a price on your head. There's a contract on you. But he goes fearlessly into the presence of the king. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than en rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ. Come on! Where does this man get his thinking? Where do you get his revelation? Look at the empire you lead it. That's the throne you're going to sit on. Look at those people with 
marvellous poles made of gold and ostrich feathers to find you to sleep at night. Look at the meals you're going to have. You're going to the back of the desert with stinking, smelly sheep. Only God could calculate what reward this amazing man is going to have. He esteemed the reproach of Christ. Let's go back to the 13th chapter, verse 13 again. <clears throat> Let us therefore go unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. I like the translation of Phillips there, not because it's English, but I think it's a good translation. He says, bearing his disgrace. Come on, bearing his disgrace. Let's go outside the camp. But bless you, he'd been outside the camp from his birth. Do you remember temple, in the temple one day, the wise man there said, we know who he is. In other words, he wasn't born of a virgin. He's illegitimate. We know who he is. He was put out of the family. He was put out of the synagogue. He's put out of the city. Yeah, it was nice. It was easy singing that lovely hymn tonight, wasn't it? Uh, oh, sacred head once wounded. You know, I'll give myself, I'll give my life, but what when you get does it, you start getting shunned? Yeah. What when your family don't want to own you? Where's your son? Has he gone to university? No, he's at Y at Y one. What's Y one? A farming community? I heard somebody say it called last days, latter days. I said, No, you got the wrong place, they're Mormons, they're over the hill. Last days are somebody different. I mean, but it's not a very highbrow college, is it? No, it isn't. Maybe it's not much. College I went to had 35 students. I'm one of the best men they turned out. They turned me out as soon as they could. <laughs> I thank God for that little school. How far are we prepared to go? I'm getting letters from all over the country and Dave Wilkerson tells me he's getting the same. Not the same letters, same thing. I've been in this church so long but it's so dry, I have to leave, I'm going to perish, I'm going to die. I saw where a man said a while ago, a preacher, if you've been in your church five years, it's time you move. I don't think you move because you get tired of seeing the same altar cloth or the same stained glass windows. You move when you get fed bread instead of stones and scorpions instead of fish. Well, some of us have left our church, and do you know what they call us? Well, I can guess. Dissenters. Oh, schismatics. Lovely words, aren't they? But that's all he got. I don't believe there's a rabbi in town would talk to Jesus. He did a wonderful thing. He split the whole nation in two. Half of them were jealous of him and the other were joyous. The joyous ones were those he redeemed. The jealous ones were those who were paralyzed and couldn't do a thing. And so they were envious and scorned. Let us go unto him. Outside the camp. Mm-hmm. Bearing his disgrace. People don't like me. Why? Well, I used to go to their house, and of course the first thing they did was bring a glass of sherry. <coughs> and then a little while after they played cards, a little while after something else, and something... I've lost all my appetite for those things. I don't do it. I remember society girls in England that came to our church. Their parents went crazy, came to see me. What's happened to my daughter? She doesn't smoke. She doesn't want to go to dance. Some of them danced at Buckingham Palace and elsewhere. They, she doesn't want to drink sherry. Oh, she's changed her lifestyle. I said, maybe she hasn't. Oh, but she has. Not she. She. Oh, see, mother thought I changed it. I stuffed her head. No, I said, she met somebody. Who did she meet? I said, I can take you to the place where your very beautiful daughter, that studied music in a conservatoire in Belgium and studied music in Italy, I can take you to the very spot where she knelt in the sawdust and I had the privilege of leading her to Christ that I preached on Isaiah 50, on Psalm 51. 
that beautiful girl that never had to do anything for herself ended up foot slogging in one of the hardest places in the world. It wasn't really a hospital, it was a makeshift hospital in Afghanistan. Climbing those mountains. I've often wondered how those dainty feet and expensive shoes she had then, of course, again, she got something more sensible, how she struggled through. But she came back radiant. She came back more enriched. She came back as though she'd been to a wedding with Jesus, which she had. She swore her allegiance to him. What we sing so easily, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. My richest gain I count but loss. Something Paul said just the other day before he left, he said, Daddy, when you think of it, there's nothing around here or anywhere else that has any value. Right. Hundreds of Christians will find they've been living for sawdust when they get to the judgment seat. Right. They missed it by a million miles. I didn't look at the scripture, but I thought just before I came in of the word of the apostle. This man again, to me my hero after Jesus, the man with a colossal intellect, the best missionary traveler the world ever saw, at home with the intellectuals, at home in the gutters. What did he say? <coughs> what things were gained to me? You don't sacrifice rubbish. So it says, I don't believe God counts what you give to him. He counts what you have left. <coughs> that would be tough on a lot of people, wouldn't it? I pay my tithe. That's God's income tax. You don't give him a dime if all you do is pay your tithe. Right. It's tithes and offerings. A man called me the other day from up north. Oh, I'm troubled in my church. They're making such an emphasis about tithing. Is there any tithing in the New Testament? I said, not that I know. But what did they do? It says they gave out of their abundance. They gave far beyond the minimum. They gave the maximum. I know one church where nearly everybody gives 30% of their income. I know some people give 50%. Not because they want a big reward, but they do it out of the abundance. They do it out of joy. They do it out of gratitude. You know, one moment in heaven, we'll all wish we'd been more sacrificial. We'll all wish we'd been more prayerful. We'll all say, Lord, would I trip up over that? Did that thing get me trapped for so many years? Was I so blind? Was I so childish? Did I let those vain things that charm me most and help me least clutter my life up? You know, I guess I've got a wild imagination at times. I think every demon in hell was watching this man struggle. It wasn't the weight of the cross that was getting him down, it was the weight of human sin that, that it represented that was killing him. I think Jesus was strong and healthy. I think he'd be about six feet, two or three. I think he was like the first Adam. He was a perfect creature. I think the last Adam was. But Jesus there, <clears throat> no demon can measure it. That's why demons fought every inch of the way from his birth. They tried to get him to cut short. Or they tried to kill him. They tried to push him over the precipice. He evaded them all, but triumphantly takes the sin, the sum total of human sin that no demon could measure, and no computer could measure. And there he is staggering, and he falls under it. And I guess every demon thought, well, he's not going to make it. And every angel was looking on. I'm going to ask those disciples, because they'll ask me a lot of questions too. Why did they escort him to that horrible, wretched Gethsemane and then to the sink of human depravity? Why did they stand at the side of the road and cheer him on and sing some psalms? They'd all run away. Who was standing there? People shooting out the lip, mocking, scorning, ridiculing, ripping his shirt off, giving his back to the smiter, bearing shame and scoffing rude. Oh, we paint nice pictures of Jesus crucified. I don't believe Jesus had a stitch on him when he was crucified. It was part of his humiliation to be naked. 
I believe his back was bloody like a ploughed field after they'd lashed and lashed and lashed him. And some idiot said, why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself? He could have proved it better than that. He could have turned them into stone while they were standing there. If all, what, if all they wanted was a miracle. Right. What does the apostle say? It's given to us to suffer for his name's sake. Yeah. The question is, what is my breaking point? Not how rich I am, not how happy I am, not how popular I am. That's got nothing to do with it. All our values, even in the church, are so false, so ridiculous. I pray that God will draw me, as we sang tonight, nearer, blessed Lord. I want him to whisper in my ear. I want him to tell me something he can't tell anybody else. I want to be able to bear something. He said, I've been waiting so many years for somebody to take that load up. They won't. I don't know where this young man is. I don't know where we were, Martha, when we heard of this young man called Bo, a young American, 21 years of age. He beat up the Amazon. He went up the Amazon, got on one of the boats that go up, then after that paid a fellow to row him up the Amazon, after that bought a little canoe himself, and disappeared for about two or three years. Then came back one day just to pick his mail up into Miami. And off he went. He hasn't been seen since. People ask me if I like to travel, sure. I travel every day of my life. I don't think there's a day of my life I don't go up the Amazon in prayer. The river Amazon is so big, if you take the map of Europe, put it on the wall and put the mouth of the river Amazon here, all the tributaries are so big they cover the whole of Europe, Russia included. <clears throat> You go up the Amazon, and then you go up the Orinoco River. You get off the Orinoco River, go up another place. Nobody knows, it's a guess. The nearest information we have, maybe, is from uh, <coughs> what's correct from time, anyhow. National Geographic, they keep discovering tribes that nobody has seen before. 2,000 years after Jesus came. And some guys want to go to a good Christian school because they have a good basketball team. If you have a basketball team, don't go within a hundred miles of the place. And no rewards for basketball. No rewards for all this tomfoolery that goes on in Bible schools. Look, if you're married to Jesus, you're married to him. And you've renounced the world, the flesh, the devil, this dirty old harlot that's called the world. World systems. You take up your cross, and brother, you'll find it pretty heavy. Despising the shame. Oh, there's a lot of shame attached to it. But I'll tell you what, when we get to the other side and see the glory. I don't think we'll ever get hoarse in heaven, at least I hope we won't. I can't imagine how much I'm going to shout when the Apostle Paul goes up for his reward. Brother, if you hear one shout that sounds like an earthquake, it will be me. After all, I've been storing it up now for 60 years to cheer him and rejoice and magnify him. Think of the glory of Jesus when he puts his nail-printed hand, pierced hand on the head of that little man, as he was in the flesh. According to tradition, five foot one, that was the height of Wesley too. But he did the work of a hundred men. In weariness, in fastings, in painfulness, in tribulation, in distress, in famine, in peril, in nakedness. So, what things were gained? His pedigree, his Hebrew pedigree, he counted it but dung. That's pretty offensive. That's all it's worth, a pile of dung. That I may win Christ and be found in him. And as I've said before, I don't understand his reckoning. <coughs> When a man has been lashed 195 times, when he's hung on a piece of wood in the Mediterranean for a night and a day, would be, what, 30 hours maybe? And all the hardships, thrice I suffered shipwreck, once I was stoned, four times I received 40 stripes, save one. And then he, the bottom line, mercy gets worse, or better, which? What's the bottom line? I glory in tribulation. 
They should have been shared out, but nobody wanted them. All were praying, Lord, help me to get through today, and Lord, bless me today, and take care of me, and don't let the dog get run over or something. He glories in tribulations, in necessities, in reproaches, scorn. Let's go forth with him, says the apostle, bearing his disgrace, sharing his disgrace. No, 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 people want to be honored, even in the church today. You know, they have honors now for preachers. I'll never get one, I'm sure of that. I don't want one. I'd be insulted if they offered me one, and I was backslid. <laughs> if I have to be like that bunch to get an honor, well, brother, I'd rather die. You know, there's not much time for us to labor for him. It's going to be over before. And I say again, we'll all be reproaching ourselves. Then. The victorious life in Christ is simple. Listen to him and obey him. That's all there is to it. Don't believe everything you hear, not even from me. Check it with the word of God. Yeah. But the secret again is trust and obey, there's no other way. Yeah. And sometimes you think this is a roadblock. Millions have thought that, but they've got through or they've got over them. And he promised to give us strength for the day. <coughs> Let us go forth with him, bearing his reproach. Think of that when your relatives say, you know, you've missed it. When somebody in your own household scorns you, that's, that's where it's hard, isn't it? When it begins at Jerusalem. When your church begins to ridicule you because you believe you've found a better way. Here's the question. Don't leave the church with an excuse. Ask yourself when you've been away from it three months, am I richer, am I, am I deeper in my spirit, am I nearer to Christ? Is Christ more precious in my prayer life? Well, go open the door and says we can have all that he has. I give you power, he said. The other day, Jotison was going to uh, Poland in May. I want you to remember him. I want you to remember him tonight. He's down at uh, Jimmy Swaggart's. Mr. Swaggart has a, what do you call it, a satellite up tonight. They're linking up a thousand churches through the nation, so let's pray, Dave, will some, say something powerful. <coughs> and the other speakers who are speaking on that program. Let's remember Paul again as they go back to that stronghold, and it sure is a stronghold. When we say I'm here on Lucas tonight, but one little word will surely fail him. I wish I knew that word. Yeah. Isn't it easy to be poetic? Remember Gary Wilkerson. Gary's working in a hell hole right in the middle of the... Uh, Detroit, Detroit. Mostly among black Muslims, young 16, 18 year olds, reckless, wild. Now they're getting a fellowship together. They got a building there, a $300,000 building for $60,000 to give away. They're getting the people in. People have never seen anything like this or heard anything like this. It's a stronghold. There's much a stronghold of the Muslim faith as some of those countries in Europe or in the Middle East there. And the devil doesn't heal territory by just saying boo. We've got that authority, power, and human. We need to pray for this. Some of you fellows told me you only once, remember? One chance. Would you rather burn out the gun at the Amazon? Become the pastor of a fancy church in town? So why didn't you go? When Mark and I were getting married, we sent out notices, don't bring any gifts, don't bring any presents. Because at that time, I thought we were going into the Arturi Forest, a forest which is as big as England in Africa, to the pygmies. The mob just shut the door. And I feel sure that the judgment, at least I offered, that God wouldn't take my eyes out. God, my sons would gone. David did a great job there in New Guinea. Most of the white people is in New Zealand now. Poor in a tough place. 
They might have a thing about jumping, I use that word, jumping down into the jungle. Wild, fierce, drunken, wicked, fighting men. And they're going to establish an outreach there. Let's pray for these and pray for these ministries around here that they'll have the anointing. Pray God will send some fire that preachers. Mercy on us, love and fire to our minds, isn't much fun. Right. God will be the living God.